Hello! In this lecture we'll be learning about power functions and root functions. Specifically, for power functions we'll learn their definitions and go over a few examples. This will include a review of how to handle exponents, fractional negative exponents, simplifying radical expressions, and the domains of radical expressions. We'll also take a look at graphs of common power functions just to see what they look like. Standard curve shapes for x to the n, where n is a positive integer, but also end behavior as a notion of what happens to the graph as x gets larger and larger in either direction. A power function is a function of the form f of x equals x to the n, where n is any real number. Now the most familiar examples of these sorts of functions are those where we have a positive integer. f of x equals x, in other words x to the first, x squared, x cubed, etc. However, other important examples of power functions occur when n is a rational number, that is a fraction of integers, or when you have a negative integer as that exponent. Now, a fractional exponent can be interpreted as radicals. For example, a to the m over n can either be written as the nth root of a to the m or the nth root of a to the m. For example, x to the 1 half is simply the square root of x, x to the 1 third is the cube root of x, x to the 5 fourths is the fourth root of x to the fifth or the fourth root of x to the fifth. Negative exponents are also related to fractions. So for any real exponent n, a to the minus n is equal to 1 over a to the positive n. For example, x to the minus first is 1 over x to the first. x to the minus second is equal to 1 over x to the positive second. x to the minus 1 half is also equal to 1 over x to the positive 1 half. And remember, that would be the same as 1 over the square root of x. So these exponent laws hold for any real value of x, including fractions, not just whole numbers or integers. We will look more closely at functions with negative exponents later on in the course when we discuss rational functions. Now, when exponential expressions with the same base are multiplied, we can add their exponents. And when they are divided, we can subtract their exponents. Specifically, if you have the same number a raised to the m and to the n, a to the m times a to the n is a to the m plus n, and a to the m over a to the n is equal to a to the m minus n. It's important that you have the same number raised to exponents here. Now these expressions are true, provided both sides of the equal sign exist. Now on the right, notice that we have a division. So we don't want to be dividing by zero. And on the left, you might not think you have any division here, but what if these are negative exponents? If one out of any of these are negative exponents, then you may have an actual division happening. So you do have to be careful about that. However, provided that all the terms written exist, they will be equal. Exponents also distribute over multiplication or division. So regardless of whether the numbers a and b are the same or not, a times b to the n is equal to a to the n times b to the n, and similarly a divided by b to the n is equal to a to the n over b to the n. And again, these are true as long as they exist. You don't want to divide by zero, which means on the right-hand side you sort of obviously have a potential problem, but on the left, if some of these exponents are negative, then you may also have a problem. So as long as these exist, they are equal. Now, because radicals and nth roots can be expressed using exponents, you get similar behavior for distributing radicals because really they're just exponents. So the nth root of AB is really just AB to the one over N power. And we've seen that you can distribute a power. So if this is a b to the 1 over n, that would be a to the 1 over n times b to the 1 over n. And similarly, a over b to the 1 over n would be a to the 1 over n over b to the 1 over n. So these will be equal again, provided that all terms exist. So let's look at some examples and simplify all of these radical expressions. Now, when a problem says simplify, it's not always clear how much to simplify. So this isn't really working towards a very specific correct answer, but just working through some manipulation of powers to get used to how they work. So let's take a look at the first. Here we have the square root of 2x cubed times the square root of 8x to the fifth. Now, because these are both the same uh, radical, the square root, we can write that as the square root of 2x cubed times 8x to the fifth. Now, under the radical, we have 2x cubed 8x to the fifth, 2 times 8 is 16, and x cubed times x to the fifth, since it's the same base of x, we can add the exponents and get x to the eighth. Now this radical 
can be distributed across the two terms. The square root of 16x to the 8th is the square root of 16 times the square root of x to the 8th. The square root of 16 is 4, and the square root of x to the 8th, that's x to the 8th to the 1 half. And x to the 8th to the 1 half would be x to the 8 times 1 half, or x to the 4th. Let's look at the second example. Here we have y to the 2 thirds times y to the 3 fourths over y, which is y to the first. Now we have all the same base, it's all y. So we can take the product of two terms and write it as the sum of exponents and the quotient with the difference. So overall, we get y to a single exponent of 2 thirds plus 3 fourths, that's from the product in the numerator, then minus 1 because we were dividing by y to the first. All we have to do now is simplify those fractions, and 2 thirds plus 3 fourths minus 1 is 5 twelfths. So overall this is the same as y to the 5 over 12. Again, provided all the terms exist. And here we see why that's important. 0 to the 5 twelfth exists. 0 to the 5th would be 0, and the 12th root of that would be 0. So 0 to the 5 twelfths is 0. But on the left here, this expression would not exist for y equals 0 because we would be dividing by 0. So here's an example of what we mean by these things are equal provided they exist, and you have problems if you're trying to divide by 0. For any number other than 0, these expressions are all equal. For y equals 0 specifically, it'd be problematic to write that because the starting expression on the left doesn't even exist. Looking at the last example, we have the square root of 9x to the 9th divided by the square root of x to the 6th. Since these are both the square root and we have a fraction, we can write it as the square root of one fraction. Now observe we have x to the 9th divided by x to the 6th. Because we have the same base of x, we can take the difference of the two exponents and write that as the square root of 9x to the 3rd. Now this square root can distribute the square root of 9 is 3. What about the square root of x cubed? There's a lot of ways you could write this. The way we've elected to do it is say that x cubed is the same thing as x squared times x. The square root of x squared is just x. Okay, so specifically what we have is that we've called this the square root of 9 times the square root of x cubed. The square root of 9 is just 3. And then for x cubed, we're going to call it x squared times x. So I can write this as 3 times the square root of x squared times the square root of x. And these will be equal, again, provided such things exist. What could the possible problem be? It's not just 0. If x is 0, I can't divide by it here, even though this looks fine. But we also have a problem with negative numbers. Suppose, for example, x is negative 1 then this doesn't even exist, so I wouldn't want to say these two things are equal. So except for x equals 0, and for x equal a negative number, nothing in the expression will exist. So here, you don't want to take the square root of a negative number, but if x is negative, x to the ninth will also be negative. So when x is negative, both sides fail to exist. When x is 0, this side exists, but this side doesn't. So let's talk about domains, okay, segueing off of the previous example. Suppose n is a positive integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And let's look at x to the 1 over n, or the nth root of x. Now the domain of this expression varies depending on whether you have an even or odd choice of n. If n is even, for example, the square root or fourth root, the domain is all non-negative real numbers. As an interval, this would be 0, including 0, and then moving to the right, going to infinity. So why does this restriction exist? We're restricting ourselves to only working with real numbers. If you're familiar with complex numbers, that's great, but we're not assuming we are and we're not using them. So since you cannot take the square root of a negative number within the real numbers, we have this restriction. So for example, the square root of negative 1 would not be a real number. The fourth root of negative 2.5 or something like that would also not be a real number. So we're restricting the domain of rational exponents where the denominator is even to be non-negative reals. In contrast, however, if you have a negative integer as that denominator, then the domain is all real numbers. The cube root of negative 8 absolutely exists as a real number. It's negative 2. Negative 2 cubed is simply negative 8. And similarly, the fifth root of minus 1 over 243 
is negative one third. If you take negative one third to the fifth power, you'll get minus one over 243. So consequently, when n is odd, if you have a cube root or a fifth root, something like that, the domain is actually all real numbers. If you were to present it as an interval, it would go from minus infinity to plus infinity, of course, not including either one. Let's look at some examples and find the domain of the following radicals. First, we have f of x equals the square root of 2x minus 1. Since we're taking a square root, we need to have the thing under the radical not be negative. 2x minus 1 bigger than or equal to 0, and now we simply need to solve for x. Add 1 to both sides, divide by 2, no problem. So the domain of this expression is all x bigger than or equal to 1 half. If you wish to present it as an interval, you would start at 1 half, including it, because in this example, x was bigger than or equal to 1 half, and then going off to infinity. For part b, we still have a square root, so we want the thing under the radical to be non-negative, so we need negative 3x plus 17 to be bigger than or equal to 0. So subtract 17 from both sides, divide by negative 3, and because we are dividing by a negative, we must reverse the inequality and we get that x should be less than or equal to 17 thirds. So the domain of this function is all x is less than or equal to 17 thirds, and here's how you would present it as an interval. Everything to the left of 17 thirds and including it. For part c, we don't have a square root, we have a cube root. That's an odd number, that three, that cube root function. So there are no restrictions, the domain is all real numbers. 5x plus 6 can be whatever we want, which means x can be whatever we want. So the domain of this function is all real numbers. If you wish to present it as an interval, it would go from minus infinity to plus infinity, and of course, including neither one. Let's look at graphs of these power functions. They occur a lot. It's very helpful to know what the graph of these functions looks like so that you can recognize them when they show up. So here is f of x equals x to the first, a nice straight line. And we've already seen as well parabolas, f of x equals x squared. There's a nice upward opening parabola. f of x equals x cubed looks kind of like this. It's a little squiggle, but it goes up to one side and down to the other. Now the square root function, you've probably plugged into a calculator at some point. Observe that it does not exist for negative x's. Otherwise, it goes up kind of sharply at the beginning, but then it slows down as x moves to the right. Now the cube root function looks somewhat like the cubing function, except it goes horizontally instead of vertically, and that's for a very good reason. As discussed in the previous uh, lecture, they are inverse functions. x cubed and x to the one third are inverse functions. So the graph of one is a reflection across the line y equals x. So if you were to draw the line y equals x and reflect the graph of x cubed across that line, you would exactly get this. And we went over that in the previous lecture. Now here is a negative exponent, 1 over x, or x to the minus 1. And the graph does something that we haven't yet seen in a function. Observe that for negative values of x, as you approach 0, the graph shoots off and gets very, very large and negative. But then for positive values of x, we're very, very large and positive. But for x equals 0 specifically, the graph doesn't exist. You cannot divide by zero, so if you were to try to plug in x equals zero, the graph does not exist on this vertical line. So what are some common shapes of these graphs? Specifically looking at integers, x to the n has a pretty predictable shape based on whether n is even or odd. When x to the n exists and n is even, you get something that kind of looks like a parabola. The larger n is, the flatter it is at the bottom and the steeper uh, it goes up away from the bottom, but it's more or less this cup-like shape. Similarly, when you have x to the n and n is odd, it looks pretty similar to x cubed. The larger n is, the flatter the flat part is and the steeper the non-flat part is, but you have overall this sort of goes up and then is flat and then goes up. End behavior is a term we use to discuss what happens to functions if you keep going to the right or you keep going to the left. And what we mean by going to the right or all the way to the right is that x is approaching positive infinity. Of course, it cannot equal positive infinity. Uh, for our purposes, infinity is not a number. Now, symbolically, what we write is x with a right pointing arrow infinity, meaning x is approaching infinity or x is going to infinity.
all the way to the left in contrast means going to minus infinity, and we could write x with an arrow to a minus infinity, and we would read that as x is approaching minus infinity or x is going to minus infinity. Now for f of x equals x to the n, where n is a positive integer, the end behavior, in other words, what happens as x goes to infinity or to minus infinity, depends on whether n is even or odd. We saw this shape on the previous slide. This is what the graph looks like for n, x to the n when n is even. Now what happens as x goes to infinity? In other words, x gets bigger and bigger. So here we see it on the right portion of the graph. As x gets bigger and bigger, the y coordinate is also getting bigger and bigger. And what we would do is we'd write it like this and say, as x goes to infinity, f of x goes to infinity. What about to the left? So now look at the graph and ask what happens if x moves to the left and gets bigger and bigger but negative. So here we have it in blue. As x moves to the left, what is happening to the graph? It's still going to plus infinity. And we would read this as, as x approaches minus infinity, f of x approaches plus infinity. But here's a graph of x to the n where n is odd. What is happening as x gets bigger and bigger? To the right, in other words, as x approaches infinity. So there we have it in orange. What's happening to the graph? It's going up. As x approaches infinity, f of x approaches infinity. But now on the left, we see something a little different. What happens to the graph as x moves left and left and left? Here it is in blue. As x approaches minus infinity, f of x approaches minus infinity. So on the left side of the page, when we have an even power, on both sides of the graph, it goes up. Whereas when we have an odd power, on the right it goes up, and on the left it goes down. Now multiplication by a constant marginally changes this behavior. Suppose you have c, which is a non-zero number, and suppose f of x is c times x to the n. Now when c is positive, you haven't really done much. You've multiplied by a positive number, but overall, whether you are going up or down doesn't change. If you go up twice as fast by multiplying by two, for example, you're still going up. And if you go down twice as fast by multiplying by two, you're still going down. This is to say the end behavior of a constant times x to the n is the same as x to the n if you are multiplying by a positive number. But if you multiply by a negative number, you've essentially reversed all of your y coordinates. If x to the n was positive and you multiply by a negative number, you are now negative. If x to the n was negative and you multiply by a negative number, you are now positive. So you reflect the curve over the x-axis. So let's match each of the following functions with its graph. We have three functions and we have three graphs. Now we're not going to use a calculator or computer algebra system. Rather, we're just going to focus on the shape of the curve and how we know these should look based on the given information that these three graphs really do match these three functions. So for the first one, we have 0.4 times x cubed. This is a positive number, 0.4, times x cubed. So it will have the same basic shape as x cubed. That's the third graph, the one on the far right. Now for b, the second, we have 2 times the square root of x. That's a positive number times root x, so it will more or less look like root x, and that's the first graph, the one on the left. Now let's look at h of x equals minus one-third times x squared. That is a negative number, minus one-third times x squared. So it's going to look like the parabola x squared, but flipped over. It will have the same shape as minus x squared, and that's the one in the middle. It's a parabola, but it's going down instead of up. 